know, I go to a lot of sales managers and say, what's your job? And they look at me and say, you know, you are an old fart. You don't understand this stuff. <laughs> and, and, and they say it's to make the number. And I said, no, you have it wrong. It's your people's job to make your, the number. Your job is to maximize their ability to perform. Mm, nice. And, and so, so what happens is we have thousands of sales managers who don't know what their job is. And that's the fault of their managers that say, you're in a different job. As, as a salesperson, your job is to make the number and, and, and to, to achieve the goals that we have in place yeah. for them. Um, as a sales manager, you get things done through your people. So mm -hmm. what you have to do is maximize your performance. Team, that's Dave Brock. He's the founder and CEO of Partners in Excellence. They're a global consulting firm that helps their clients outperform and outsell competitors. Dave's also the author of the Sales Manager Survival Guide. And that's something we really unpack in today's podcast. We talk about the role of sales management and specifically why it's such a difficult role. His book is focused on frontline sales management. And we talk about why that role is so difficult and how critically important it is in professional sales today. I share a story or two about my early um, experiences in sales management and uh, spoiler alert, I didn't do very well. So if you like hearing about my failures, you're really going to enjoy today's podcast. Now, we unpack a lot of different topics today, including coaching, how to, how to focus our time and effort coaching our teams to elevate performance. We also talk about how it's a little bit back to the future these days in professional sales. We've got to focus on having better conversations with clients and prospects about how to help them and talk a lot less about us. These topics get covered and many, many more today. Um, really enjoyed my conversation with Dave Brock, and I hope you do too. And if you do, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast. Here it comes, Dave Brock. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for joining the show today. It's such a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks. It's a great opportunity. I'm glad to, well, I'm flattered by the invitation and glad to participate. Well, the invitation came, Dave. I've, I've actually heard you on a number of other podcasts and seen some of your things, really enjoyed your discussions. Um, and, you know, you do speak to a couple of topics that are very close to my heart and to the heart of the people who listen to the Selling Well podcast. Um, one is just this whole topic of sales management. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things the folks who listen to our podcast have heard me say a number of times I have called out that I think sales management is actually, or, or VP of sales, CRO, the, the toughest job on the executive team. So that's a, a, certainly a topic I want to unpack here today for sure. But maybe before we jump in, Dave, maybe you could share for the folks here just the short version of your journey in professional sales. <laughs> okay. Well, I, 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 I started my career... <clears throat> being a theoretical physicist and I was studying for my PhD at Berkeley and planned to either become a professor or a researcher at, uh, uh, at the, uh, uh, in, in the labs. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, one weekend I was skiing at Heavenly Valley and met this inventor and we decided to ski together for the day and we were talking, you know, we'd ski and then in the chairlift talk about his invention and how I brought it to market. And, you know, that was back in the old days before email. So, um, you know, I got back to my apartment. I wrote him a letter, sent something and said, here's what you need to do with your product to really, you know, move forward, blah, blah, blah. And so a week later, I get a call. Here I am. I'm, I'm about 21 years old. He, um, typical Silicon Valley story. He says, hey, Dave, you want to become my vice president of engineering and development? You know, we can do wow. great things and so on and so forth. And I didn't realize that what it also meant is on alternating Thursdays, I emptied the trash cans in the office. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The coffee there cup. you go. But, uh, but anyway, we were a magnificent failure. Um, and I quickly learned that there's a lot to business success. Uh, uh, 
than having hot products. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went, got my MBA, and then ended up for a, a theoretical physicist from Berkeley. I ended up going to the darkest side of the world. I went to sell mainframe uh, computers for IBM in New York City to money center banks. Oh, back in the day, that would have been yeah. a very interesting job. Yeah. And so that's how I got my start in, uh, in sales. I ended up uh, going up the food chain in IBM and a number of uh, uh, management positions, ran a division and got IBM into some new businesses, then was recruited away as CRO. Uh, well, we didn't call it CRO at the time, but CRO of uh, for some turnaround, uh, large turnaround technology companies. And since then, it held kind of um, uh, CRO or CEO jobs of a variety of companies. I founded a couple of software companies uh, along the way. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I must have some form of adult ADD because, you know, I'm, I find I'm a really good problem solver, but once I've solved the problem, I get bored and I create problems. And boards <laughs> of directors don't really appreciate that very much. So sure. I, I found this consulting company and, and it's, uh, we have 15 people scattered around the world. And it's such a fascinating job. I work with some of the smartest people in the world, uh, my clients dealing with some of the most difficult business and sales challenges we can imagine, you know, and we get people with different experiences in a room trying to figure out how do we solve these problems and move forward. So that's kind of my story. What a, by the way, what a great story. And then the consulting firm Partners in Excellence, correct? Mm -hmm. so, so solving some of the toughest sales challenges in the world. One of the things just for some of the listeners here who may not know, but back in the day, it was a different world where when you get hired in sales in a technology organization, they actually provided proper training, onboarding, orientation. Yeah. And, and it was actually a little bit of, um, it was a bit of a kind of a boot camp where many people would be hired. Not everybody would actually make it through the training. Mm -hmm. um, how long was the, the training period with IBM back then from the back time you got hired before you saw that first yeah, client? Back in those days, it was kind of a luxury that we don't think of, uh, no. we don't see many companies doing anymore, but technically it was about 18 months. You'd be hired in, uh, you'd go you know, to a, a training program uh, offsite uh, with yeah. a bunch of people from all over the world, um, maybe work for four weeks or so, go back and, and support salespeople in, in OJT type of experiences. Then a few months later, you go to another one. And so technically you weren't put on quota for about 18 months or so. Um, and, and, you know, and again, that was such probably one of the most fantastic experiences I've ever seen really, I think, prepared me uh, for a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, you don't see that anymore. And it, it's, it's a huge investment. Yeah, I do think uh, investments like that pay off, whether 18 months is the right thing. But, yeah. you know, most of the time we say, you know, we hire people and say, you know, here's our, our product. Here's our playbooks for our products. You know, go take a few of these e-learning courses. And by the way, your quota is uh, this and I need your forecast next Tuesday. Yeah, yeah it's, it's by the way, it's a real shame. And, and that's a, a real pet peeve of ours. Um, given the fact that the impact that can have on a young person's self-esteem of, you know, that first job not working out, mm -hmm. and you'd, be, you'd be surprised to know major SaaS organizations, you know, that are world-class names and some of the top technology companies in the world. And you, you'll speak to kind of a middle or senior manager and they say, yeah, we hire 30 people. We actually do group interviews. And when we get them on board, we expect, you know, a month after they've been hired, there's about 10 or 11 who make it. Even for on, on my end, um, Dave, when I started, I started selling photocopiers in the early 90s, but that was the only technology around because, yeah. you know, the commercially viable browser was 96. I got hired by Kodak selling photocopiers and got shipped to Rochester and it was 90 days before I saw a client. It was, a, it, they call it a marketing education center where all week, every week you were doing training and then demos. And as you said, there were people from around the world in your cohort. 
Yep. And, you know, you started with 80 people. And by the time you graduated 90 days later, there, there was maybe 65, but it was very methodical in terms of this sort of uh, lab type environment for selling. And I, and I remember and, doing a lot of uh, speeches at, at that yeah. education center. So yeah, we yeah, was met, uh, uh, cross paths at, at one of those. So I, I wouldn't be surprised because back in those days, there were some, uh, there were actually some uh, joint partnerships in those days. But, but that, well, in those days, I was, a, I had my consulting company and George Fisher became the CEO and George had been a client when he was at uh, Motorola. Right. He went, when he went over, he called me up and he said, Dave, there's a lot we need to do at Kodak. Can you come help me? So how about uh, that? Kodak yeah. was a, a great client for a, a number of years. What a small world indeed it is. And by the way, folks, for those listening, I also had noticed over the last kind of 10 years in my career, that there were a lot of these folks who end up becoming the CROs at some point in time, they, I, I call it, they had their ticket stamped in sales. So they went through a formal methodical, well thought out training program. You know, they didn't learn the profession through a platitude on LinkedIn. They actually learned the profession through a structured training program that was ongoing, you know, and ongoing certifications were re required to maintain it. And they received professional management at all levels within the firm. So as they grew up, they, they really divide, you know, developed all of these kind of mindset, skill sets and tool sets that are so important today, but they really are missing today. Yeah. So, so well, well I think, let me interrupt though. I, I think, you know, is, you know, we can revel in the past and, and those kinds of things. And those are great programs. But, you know, as I look at some of the things that we're doing today, some of the extraordinary things we're doing with e-learning, some of the tools that we have available to sales yeah. people, you know, uh, you know, I don't think those, those kind of long programs are necessarily the right thing. I don't think that all that we're doing today is necessarily the right thing, particularly when you look at the failure rates. But but I think there's so much good that we do right now. If we harness it really well, if you look at, at really effective sales enablement organizations and you tie that with leadership that is very purposeful, that has a value system that lives and in, 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 in drives that every day and frontline managers who are coaching and developing uh, and caring for their people, you know, we see great things. We see super high performance organizations. So, you know, so there's a huge amount of good today, but too often we get focused on the latest bad or shortcut, or we try and find excuses for not doing our job and, and getting something, you know, finding the latest trick or gimmick to do it for us. Mm -hmm. but, you know, if you do the job, if you commit to learning and developing, if you have the resources around you and your company commits to it, you know, we just, again, we're privileged to work with organizations that are super high performers. And, you know, they're not trying to say, how do I, how do I make my number? They're trying to say, how, how do we keep our outstanding performance? How do we keep ahead of all the competitors and set the example for everybody else in the world? You know, so it's not that tough. It's some basic fundamentals. It's caring, it's commitment, it's commitment to continued improvement. So, so caring commitment, an interesting one in professional sales, certainly leadership. You've touched on coaching, mm -hmm. very interesting one in professional sales today. But when you say it's not that complicated, I, I've um, you know, done some research on, on your frameworks in the past. Let, let's talk a little bit about what we should be doing, whether we're the CEO of a mid-sized enterprise today, whether we're a sales leader or a CRO trying to build for an organization. T tell me a little bit about a couple of things. First of all, your sales execution framework. You have a way of thinking through these things that we need to, to address um, to really focus on these fundamentals. Well, the, the sales execution framework is, is um, is kind of a model that we've developed to say, how do all the pieces, parts of a salesperson's job fit together? Hmm. You know, and, and as leader, as salespeople and as leaders, we have to, we have to do the whole job. 
Um, you know, we can't just say, well, I'm only going to do this part because it's my favorite part of doing the job. It's what I'm really good at, you know, because, you know, you, you get a lot of salespeople that say, I love doing deals. Mm -hmm. Well, pretty soon your pipeline empties out. And so if you aren't doing something to find those deals and feed the pipeline, um, you, you, uh, you fail. You know, right now it's fashionable because we struggle with it so much, but it's fashionable to say, you know, all we have to do is prospecting. We, we do enough volume, we do enough velocity. Um, we stuff the pipeline with all sorts of stuff and all the numbers will come out. You know, the, the problem is, is, is you can't do one or the other. You have to do the whole job and you have to understand how those things tie together. Um, and all is there's there's real cause effect relationships between these, and you can start saying, where do I get my performance leverage? If I'm looking at at trying to to draw things together, how do I get my performance leverage? And and so what we found was, even experienced executives, managers, and so on, struggled with how do the pieces parts interrelate to each other. Mm -hmm. What is that cause effect relationship? How do I start looking at the data and understanding it and understanding where my performance levers? Yeah. So what do I do today that drives performance? So, so we've taken that and we've applied it, you know, either on an organizational level to look at really organizational transformation. And for instance, we have one client, a real high performing client several years ago, um, they're the best of breed in, in their marketplaces, super sales performance, and so on and so forth. But they found they're going to have to be hiring four or 500 people a quarter to continue to meet their growth goals. And four or 500 that, people a quarter. Right. Wow. So, so, so one was that was unachievable. Two is that was unaffordable. And mm -hmm. so they had to start saying, how do we look at how all this fits together and how do we change what we do? And we started looking at things, doing some analysis, and we said, well, one is each salesperson handles roughly a thousand uh, customers, average deal size is $10,000. So we said, what if we change that? What if we set a target of average deal size of $500,000? And oh, by the way, you have to do that from 15 customers. Hmm. Wow. Um, and then so you started rethinking how all this stuff works and how you achieve that, how you develop the skills and so on and so forth, how you manage it. Well, you know, in nine months, they got up to, to over one hundred thousand dollars today. Three years later, uh, their average deal size is a million and a half dollars. Wow. You know, and what they found is those deals wow. always existed, but they were so busy doing transactions they didn't see those deals and their competition was getting them. Hmm. You know, so we figured out how do we handle those $10,000 deals with an, um, with an indirect sales organization and how do we take those people so we dramatically improved their productivity, but they needed a model and a framework to look at the data and understand that. The other thing we do is we look at that as an individual frontline manager coaching somebody and we say, you know, how do I look at somebody's performance and, um, and see what is the, the thing that I, I can do today with this individual that has the highest leverage? So the example I give all the time is imagine um, two salespeople, um, Mark and Dave. We mm -hmm. both have the same quotas, $5 million. We'll make them Canadian dollars. Um, yes, thank you for that. Yeah, so yeah, it's you know we Americans can get a little arrogant. Jeez, I can breathe a sigh of relief. It's not as much as five million American dollars. But anyway, so we both have five million dollars. We both have a pipeline of ten million dollars. Um, uh, Mark has a, a win rate of forty percent. Dave has a win rate of twenty percent. As a manager, what do you do to coach them? Hmm. So when I'm speaking in front of groups, managers raise answers easy, Dave. They got, they got to get out and prospect. They got to build 3X pipeline. And you say, oh. Do you? For that, Mark? That's the wrong thing for each person. Because right. Mark is a pretty good salesperson. He has a 40% win rate. If you force Mark 
to go from a 2x pipeline to a 3x pipeline, you'll actually di distract him mm -hmm. from closing and winning business. He only needs a $12.5 million pipeline. Right. So how do I coach Mark to prospect and find that little increment without reducing his effectiveness at, at managing and closing deals? Dave, on the other hand, sucks. He's a terrible salesperson. He has a 20% win rate. If he got up to 3x pipeline, he'd still fail because he needs 5x pipeline. But even worse is Dave is such a bad salesperson, he's going to be an even worse prospector. Mm -hmm. and, and not only is he not going to be able to fill his pipeline, but he's going to create a huge amount of negative brand equity with all the people he inflicts Interesting, himself on. yeah. Interesting. So, so rather than coach it, what the natural reaction of every manager is rather than coaching Dave on prospecting and, and beating the crap out of him to get his 3x pipeline, which we know will fail, how do I make Dave a better salesperson? How do I help him manage his deals better? That changes the dynamics of his pipeline. And by doing that, I know he'll be a more effective ambassador of our company and a more effective prospector. So it's, it's the struggle managers have, their natural instincts or the fashionable instincts are to react to the number and not dig down and understand yeah. what does the number mean? And so based on that, where's the highest leverage point for me to drive, help that salesperson improve and drive performance? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a great example. And you said, you know, the, the tendency of the sales manager is to maybe look at a cookie cutter approach of what the ideal funnel might look like theoretically without taking into consideration the specifics of the individual and their particular data. Yeah. And, it, and it leads to me, um, Dave, a little bit, and I'm interested in your opinion on this. You know, so one of the things we talk about a lot is saying, hey, that role of a sales manager starts to get incrementally difficult these days. It seems like it's at times almost an impossible job because they have the three most demanding stakeholders in business, all very important, but demanding. They have clients, okay? mm -hmm. so require lots of attention. If you're an excellent sales manager, you're in front of clients. They have salespeople that need lots of care and feeding and time and attention and support and coaching, as you've aptly pointed out. But they're also reporting into an executive team or a board that's relentless in their pursuit of a number, depending upon the size, scale, funding of a company. So we, we, we think about it always as this, all, you know, extremely difficult job, which may have led to why you wrote the sales manager survival guide. Tell us a little bit about that publication and what prompted you to write it and some of the core messaging there. Well, so, so the sales manager survival guide is really uh, targeted to frontline sales managers, not the top sales executive. But it's, it's interesting. I get emails and calls from CEOs that said, I read this. I wish I read it back when I was a frontline sales manager, but I can still take a lot of the things that, and apply those to my senior executives. But, right. but anyway, you know, because you know, we inv it's, it's interesting. We did some research back when we published that in 2016. And so 2015, 2016, we were doing some research and we spend billions of dollars in sales training, most of which is wasted. And at the time we were spending somewhere in North America around 300 to $400 million in any kind of sales management training at all levels. Wow. Um, and, and so one is we are under, uh, under investing in sales manager development. So, so that's one thing. So we wanted to help address that too, as you look at it. And, and, you know, I go to a lot of sales managers and say, what's your job? And they look at me and say, you know, you are an old fart. You don't understand this stuff. <laughs> and, and, and they say it's to make the number. And I said, no, you have it wrong. It's your people's job to make your, the number. Your job is to maximize their ability to perform. Mm, nice. And, and so, so what happens is we have thousands of sales managers 
who don't know what their job is. And that's the fault of their managers that say, you're in a different job. As, as a salesperson, your job is to make the number and in, in, in to, to achieve the goals that we have in place yeah. for them. Um, as a sales manager, you get things done through your people. So mm -hmm. what you have to do is maximize your performance. So right now we have huge numbers of managers that don't understand that and they're doing the wrong thing and the only thing they can fall back on is their past experience as individual contributors yes so, so so we're not orienting them to do what their job is and how they do that so then the second thing then is how do i maximize the performance of my people is is you know and it's a whole bunch of things uh, do i have the right people on board have i recruited and hired the right people do they have the skills they need to do that? Have they gone through the right training and development and so on and so forth? Do they have the right tools and resources? Do they have the right support from within the organization to do that? So, you know, we, we make sure that, you know, are all these things in place? Do they know how to leverage them and so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. And then three, uh, finally, is what am I doing to coach them and, and develop them both from a day-to-day -day performance point of view, but to maximize their potential in their development over their career so that they grow as professionals. And so that's what Sales Manager Survival Guide tries to provide tools and help for the sales managers on. And it's, it's amazing the reaction that you get from people that say, I never knew this before. I never knew how to, how to use these tools. I never knew how the pieces, parts of this fit together. And also, so now they have kind of a, a, a survival guide that helps them um, uh, achieve those things. And, and, you know, and I think the frontline sales management uh, uh, role is, continues to be one of the most neglected roles in, uh, in, um, in developing sales and driving sales organizations right now. And if I look to weaknesses in sales organizations, you can always start looking in, in the data tells you that the salespeople, you know, there are few turkeys in the world mm. uh, and hopefully we weed them out, but, uh, and there are few people that, that just are uncoachable and undeveloped, und undeveloped and we weed them out. But by and large, people want to do their jobs. They may just not know how to do that. Yeah. And if they're being led by people who don't know how to help them do that, then we're going to have a huge performance gap. And, and again, you see sales managers that are struggling and don't know how to do that. And that it's fascinating in about the last three years, we've seen a, a lot more attention to the role of the, the frontline sales manager. So, you know, and I kind of contend the frontline sales manager job is, is definitely different from the CRO job. In smaller organizations, they may be the same person. Yeah. But the focus of the CRO is very, very different. Um, it's not that it's not difficult, but it's very different. But you know, you, you look at that frontline sales manager who's kind of caught between day-to-day -day performance and how do I translate the strategy priorities and goals of the organization into what I need to do every day and what my people need to do every day. Well, first of all, uh, with apologies, Dave, I think you're actually being interviewed by one of those turkeys. So, so but <laughs> we'll, we'll pick that up at a later date. But um, if I look, you know, th th this issue of, um, you know, not enough focus on training and developing sales managers, the number that I've seen, by the way, in terms of being spent on sales training annually, I believe this came from Saint Frank Sapiti's book, um, Sales Management That Work, I think, was, was in the area of 20 billion. And I've seen numbers of publications call out and say it's only a tiny fraction of that that's actually spent on training sales managers. And if I look at my own personal journey, when I, you know, back in the year 2000, I became a sales manager at a corporate level for the first time. Yeah. After having been a bit of the Wayne Gretzky of sales of the sales team, and within a very short period of time, 
I was miserable in that job and everybody on the sales team was miserable in the job. My ability to destroy the sales culture, not knowing what to do as a sales manager was incredibly high, you know, and literally within a year, I was, I was so distraught. I was thinking of leaving and certainly everybody on the team was miserable because of the way I was managing the team because I just continued to be a really good salesperson. And so yeah. I just couldn't understand why everybody on the team couldn't execute a sales process exactly as I had done it. I was pretty comfortable trying to get in front of deals to make sure I closed them. So now I'm taking away their ownership and autonomy yeah. and authority on a deal. Um, they're feeling lousy. And, and because of that behavior, there was, there was a wall of people being defensive. So I couldn't coach them because they didn't trust that I actually cared about them. Mm -hmm. So, so the whole thing became this spiral of doom and being a very large organization I was working for, um, that often don't make good decisions, even though I was awful, I kept getting promoted. And it was only once I was promoted into run a division of something I knew nothing about that I actually started learning the fundamentals of proper management. Yeah. And because I had nothing to default, I couldn't tell people things. All I could do was help lead them to the right answer with their own uh, unique abilities and, and, and skills and guidance. So, so one of the things I'd love to, you know, a lot of our folks um, that uh, join the podcast and certainly everything I see with the clients we work with and coach and consult, this topic of sales coaching, of coaching, it feels to me, Dave, that, that this is what gets dropped off of the table when yeah. a sales manager is feeling the pressure of hitting the number or feeling the pressure of recruiting and so on and so forth. Tell me a little bit about some of the, some of the core principles that your team helps in terms of uh, coaching, helping all of us be better coaches. Well, and, and I think you, you raise a, a very realistic scenario is I think in our mindset, we tend to think of the business management aspects of a sales manager's job and the coaching aspects of the sales manager's job. And we separate them. And guess what? When things are, are tough, guess what gets dropped? It's the coaching piece because right. I'm so focused on, you know, are we making the numbers, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And so what we, we do is we say, you know, you have to integrate them together, not only from a time management point of view, but from an effectiveness and in, in, um, in development point of view is, is if I integrate these business management discussions with how do you get better? How do you think about things differently? I have a much, much better impact. So, so number one is stop thinking of these things separately. Start mm, stop scheduling a coaching session and then a pipeline review or a deal review or an account plan review or so on and so forth. All of these, you integrate coaching um, and purposefulness in terms of business management together. And, and you literally kill two birds with one stone. I mean, you mm -hmm. think of, you know, Starbucks lines are some of the best places I've ever had to stand with a colleague or, or stand with a client and coach them as we're waiting to grab our coffee. Mm. You know, so there are opportunities, you know, coaching isn't necessarily a 30 minute hour conversation. It could be a one sentence or, or 30 second observation that you make uh, and, or question that you ask that causes people to think differently. So one is you integrate these two together. Two is, is you're very purposeful about what you're coaching and how you're coaching. So for instance, the example I always give is every single pipeline review I've ever sat in, at least until I've inflicted myself on the client, mm -hmm. is, is never is a pipeline review. It always becomes a series of linked deal reviews. Yeah, true. So what happens is we never have a proper pipeline review. We never diagnose the issues with the pipeline. We never coach the salesperson on how to do that. So 
the goal and objective of a pipeline review is very distinct from a deal review, is very distinct from an account review, very distinct from territory and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. and so we have to be very clear and purposeful about this is the purpose of this kind of meeting. And this is what I need to coach and how I need to coach this kind of thing. So, so one is, is being purposeful about the different coaching opportunities. The second thing is how to coach, you know, and basically there's uh, the tell mode, which so many of us fall into, which is, you know, this is the way I did it when I was the Wayne Gretzky of the sales organization. Yeah. The same thing. Um, and you'll be successful is rather than getting the people to think differently and asking them questions about, have you considered what if, why did you do it this way? What was the response? Is there a better way to do things? So there's kind of the, the, the mix between directive and non-directive coaching. There's yeah. some people that say you have to do non-directive. Well, so, you know, if I'm sitting in a car with you and we're going 60 miles an hour towards a telephone post, I'm going to be very directive and say, Mark, slam on the brakes. Right. But, you know, if we're in a different situation, I'm going to be non-directive. So it's, it's is what to coach, how to coach. And then, you know, we can't just have those conversations. We have to agree on what are the next steps that we're going to take, who has a responsibility by when, and we have to follow up. We have to close that loop, otherwise it never gets done. And we have to keep developing the people. And in your experience, Dave, um, you know, how much time are managers, let's just start with managers. In the organizations that you get your privilege to work with, how much time are managers spending preparing for these and intentionally thinking about you know, where Mark Cox needs coaching or where Wayne Gretzky needs coaching or where Dave Brock needs coaching versus just uh, reacting or, you know, reacting in the moment to whatever they see. So, so uh, first, if you look at the data and uh, the latest CSO Insights uh, data I saw shows managers on average spending less than 30 minutes a week coaching all their people. All of their people combined. Yeah. What a so, shocking, what a, by the way, I'm not, I'm not terribly surprised by that, but I'm certainly alarmed by it. Yeah. So, so is, is, you know, so they aren't doing it. And part of it is they don't know that that's part of their job. So that's the fault of more senior management. They don't know how to do that. That's the fault of not being developed and trained and so on and so forth. Yeah. So, so one is, they have to recognize the, the highest leverage that the managers have in driving performance is through coaching. Here's where I get to be a little bit non-traditional is, is to say, I don't care so much about the time that you spend. Should you be spending an hour a week with each person? Should you be spending, what, what should that time? What I care about is the impact that you have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, so, you know, I mentioned you can have a great conversation standing in a Starbucks line. Um, you, I, you know, in the old days when we used to drive places, you know, a lot of my coaching would be windshield time. Yeah, right. You know, as, as I, I yeah. was driving to a customer with a, a salesperson, as we were coming back, we had lots of great time to coach, what do we want to accomplish in this meeting? And on the way back, did we accomplish it? What could we have done better? And so on yeah. and so forth. You know, so you find opportunities to coach people all the time. So, so I think we have to be purposeful, less focused on the amount of time, but saying, and, and the other thing too, is I think we tend to try and coach too much. And as a result, we confuse people. I, I used I, I started to try to learn how to play golf about 10 years ago. Mm. I had some, uh, actually, one of my RVPs who, who I was at corporate headquarters and he had to manage the region that included corporate headquarters. So he lived there, was a scratch golfer. Uh, wow. Um, 
And he said, oh, Dave, let, glad you want to play golf. Let's go out and I'll teach you. So we went, went out, you know, and he said, you know, Dave, do these 25 things. Yeah. And I, you know, I tried to do all those 25 things and I hit the ball. I really hit the ball off the tee and it went 200 yards that way. <laughs> right into the woods. Yep. And, and, and you know, and he kept saying, well, no, you got to do this. You know, and, and so finally I said, thanks, Sherman. Let's give it a rest. I went to hire a <laughs> pro and, 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 and that pro looked at what I did. He says, do this one thing. Yeah. And I started mastering it. And then I went to him a few weeks later. He said, now try this. And so what, we, and, and here's where like the sales execution framework helps is what is the one thing that I can identify that I get my person to master and then the next thing and the next thing. And what we find is time to results and time to effectiveness when you do that is actually shorter yeah. than Sherman teaching me how to do 25 things at one time at the T. Right. Um, it's uh, what a great analogy, by the way, uh, Dave. And I also took up golf as an adult, you know, played hockey from the time I was three, but, and it's very difficult as an adult. And I, I also, you know, had a great coach and it was always the two or three things to work on in between lessons. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I mean, fast forward today, my handicap is me. So I, I'm still, I, I, I <laughs> golf, but yeah, uh, yeah. But, but with, with I, I find the same thing and there's that, that excitement. If you're not, I, I find we react in a one-on-one -on -one or a meeting with a salesperson instead of respond. Yeah. And, and for me, I'm just, um, you know, I, I, I've always thought, hey, I just don't have this, um, you know, confidence of everybody else where I just want to be and I'm going to ad hoc everything. And I acknowledge I'm a genius at everything I do and everything comes out of my mouth. I'm actually emotional and I'm excitable. And so it's really important for me that when I think about a, never mind a client meeting, which it's critical for, but for a one-on-one, -on -one, I like to take 15 or 20 minutes the day before a one-on-one -on -one with somebody and just think about, okay, what is, what am I actually trying to accomplish in this one-on-one? -on -one? So if I kind of assess, how are they doing? And what do I think the issue is? And, you know, maybe what three or four questions might I ask them so that they actually start to think about things differently? And then I love your idea. And then how do we align on a game plan moving forward? So, and I, I think that point's really critical. Again, I, I get less concerned about how much time you spend. You just have to invest the right time. Yeah. But, but you know, the coaching process is one of, how do I prepare? Mm -hmm. Also, how do I make sure the person I'm coaching is prepared? Right. So, so how do I prepare? How do I make sure that individual comes into the coaching situation, whether it's a Zoom call or whatever, and is prepared that we're on the same page for what we're trying to accomplish? Yeah. Two, then how do I execute a high impact coaching discussion, which is really a collaborative learning process? Yes. Three is once we go through that, what do we agree on what we do next? Mm -hmm. And then four is let me follow up to see what's done, what happened and how we coach, how we coach the outcomes of those things and how we develop. So, you know, there's that process and to, too many of us through arrogance or inexperience, you know, are, are, we're smart good people to be a great salesperson you have to be smart you have to be quick but we shoot from the lip all the time mm -hmm. and we're not prepared and we're not purposeful it's just like a great call plan you know just because i've gone through a thousand of these calls before and a thousand of these situations i gotta be prepared for this particular meeting so it's interesting the principles to be a great salesperson are the principles to be a great sales manager. And guess what? Your customer is your person. Right. Yeah. Um, and so now we start looking at some other important characteristics is from a sales point of view, 
how do I create value for the customer? Well, first, I'm curious. Second, I care. Mm. So start saying, well, if I'm a manager, shouldn't I be curious and shouldn't I care? And if I just display that in working with my people, I I move forward in in tremendous ways. So so Dave, I'm smiling um, because... I just had this conversation with someone and it was, it's, it, it aligns perfectly with what you've come up with, which is uh, this is an organization got about 180 salespeople and maybe 25, 26 managers. And I was having a chat with one of the managers who was having a tough time, by the way, with one of their people mm-hmm. and the, the individual, the salesperson in particular was a mature salesperson who's doing, who's doing quite well and had been with this business a long period of time and maybe close to you know retirement maybe close to retirement but um, this person was behaving you know complete lone wolf which in many cases is all great as long as the manager's kept in the loop and and i think the manager you know felt like he was banging his head up against the wall trying to trying to connect with this person and i asked the question i said why does this person s- still sell for us why are they in the job? Mm-hmm. What are they? Why are they doing this? And and he, he took a pause. Very thoughtful fellow I was working with, and he said, "You know, I really don't know the answer to that question because he had inherited this person. Mm-hmm. He didn't build his own team. He had in, taken over the role and inherited." And he said, "You know what? I think I need that conversation. You know, and I mm-hmm. I really it's this sounds like a platitude, but I absolutely believe that your team actually cares what you know." Once they actually know that you care. Yeah. And I think you do have to get to know, you have to get to know your team and your people and understand what's important to them. And that, that aligns also, Dave, to your value system connection. Yeah. Where, you know, you have to understand them, feel free to share about you. And it, it's not like we're managing, we have to be friends, but I do have to, I really want to understand what's important to you. And, and, and so that as we, you know, I I can have a bigger picture of how do I actually help you get to the things you're trying to achieve? Yeah, Yeah, we we get confused as individuals of mixing friendship and caring and and Mm. they're not necessarily, they overlap, but they're not necessarily the same things, you know, but but I think, you know, one of the, I, I mean, I think I'll say something that's very contradictory, but but right now, the world of sales is in tremendous trouble. At the same time, I think this is never a better time to be in sales and selling than right now because there's so much huge change going on. But we've become so mechanistic. We've become so depersonalized. Um, You know, we look at things like, think of this. The latest data point I see says average tenure of salespeople and uh, sales managers is 11 months. So Jeez. now run the math on that. Say we have a, 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 a three month onboarding program, you know, then I have to start building a pipeline. Then, you know, if I have a sales cycle that's three months, six months, nine months, you know, in complex B2B sales, you know, we see sometimes onboarding takes nine months or more in your sales cycle is 18 months, two years. So run the math on that. And you say, this doesn't add up. Mm-hmm. We invest all this time. Whatever results that person produces in 11 months is actually a result of that person's predecessor. And yeah, so indeed. everything starts crumbling. And so, so one is, is we have this thing of no tenure. Um, and you start saying, well, why is there no tenure is, is one is we create and, and we start getting into this thing called the great resignation right now. Yeah. We don't care about our people. Our people recognize that and they want to go someplace, not just to make money, but where they feel included, where they feel engaged, where they feel there's a future for them in their organization. A lot of people say Gen Z's will never stay in a job a long time. Well, I spend a lot of time with Gen Z's and Gen Z's say, give me a place where I can create meaning in my life. Hmm. And I love it and I'll stay there. 
And I have, you know, one of my largest clients is um, one of the highest performing semiconductor companies in the world. Their voluntary and involuntary attrition is 2%. Wow. I go into wow. other organizations right now where voluntary and involuntary attrition is, is 50%. Yeah. Think of it just from a greedy business point of view. Think of the opportunity cost. Think of the billions of dollars of opportunity that are lost in that. So it's not, it's, you can have this business focus that says caring, creating meaning, having a value system, reinforcing that, um, you know, are all create alignment around the goals we're trying to achieve yeah. and drive us, our ability to achieve that. And we've lost a lot of that. Now, what you do see is organizations changing profoundly, recognizing that. Um, and particularly the leaders are changing profoundly. And what's happening is they're widening the gap between everybody else. What a spectacular point. And, and you know, about the Gen Zs, I think in many ways, they're kind of smarter than we, we were. And, and certainly I know I started a career in the middle of the last great kind of, you know, um, uh, one of a, a great recession, the 90s, early 90s, 1991 where literally companies were saying, we've got a hiring freeze. Most people yeah. today have never even heard of that, but they were saying, we're not hiring anybody. So to get a job, you had to wait till somebody else left that sales organization. But, but I think today the, the uh, Gen Z's are smarter where they say, listen, I know I've got options and I wanna go somewhere where I can, as you say, have that meaningful growth. Yeah. And this is why I like the topic of coaching so much because I actually believe you know, they want the, the organization to be the right organization. But, but when people grow and develop, even if it's tough, they, they stay, they enjoy, you know, they know it's the right thing. We've all had bosses who may, maybe weren't the most touchy feely. They're not our best friends, but we knew we were getting better working with them and they were fair. Yeah. And so, so as long as those things are in place, you know, we may have had a hockey coach or two. Same thing. We yeah. knew deep down they cared, but they weren't asked, you know, buddying up with us on the, tr the travel bus, you know, asking us about our girlfriends. They were, they were in charge, but they were trying to make us better athletes and better people. Yeah. I mean, th there's, you know, there's the old relationship builder type, you know, and I, I had a lot when in my executive roles, I had a lot of salespeople calling on me and I'd always get birthday cards, anniversary cards. My wife would get a birthday card, so on and so forth. And when the going got tough, they'd take me to lunch and things like that. So they wanted to be my friend, but what they weren't doing was helping me address the issues that we had in the organization. Yeah. And here's the, the real magic in selling is the things, the example that we set as great leaders within our own organizations are the behaviors we want them to display with our customers. Think of what drives customer loyalty. Think of what drives value creation. It's demonstrating that you care. It's being curious and talking to them both about the problems their organization is facing, but what they want to achieve themselves. You know, so great leaders should, within sales become these great mo role models for fantastic selling and fantastic customer retention, growth, and, and relation value creation. And, you know, it's to me, I can't get why people don't get that because we strictly do the numbers. You know, you aren't, you aren't hitting the numbers, double your emails, double your dials, you know, is, is, you know, ma all, we be worse, faster. Yeah. Be yeah. worse, faster. Yeah. It's not working. Yeah. Do more of it. Do more of what and, isn't and, working. And they don't get down and understand and they don't, you know, and, and when you look behind that, they don't really care. I mean, I'm uh, in the fall, you'll see, the selling executive survival guide and that really focuses on top executives uh, come out and what we when we first went into this we first started saying it's the, all the processes and systems and the tools it's the recruiting philosophy and so on and so forth all that's bullshit what we found about is what's the purpose of the organization what's the culture what's the values 
and what do leaders do on a day-to-day -day basis to set that example and perform against that? And those are the things, and it, you go back to like a variant of this is the old Peter Drucker quote, uh, quote is um, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, right. is, is, is we've forgotten those things. And I think in our, our uh, you know, I think a lot of this SaaS kind of selling methodology is become so mechanistic and we've lost the individual in that. And that's why we have the great resignation. That's why we have 11% uh, or 11 month tenure. That's why the latest data I show is 29% of people are meet, meeting, meeting their quotas. It has nothing to do with the pandemic, the recession or anything like that. It has to do with these underlying reasons. So again, you see that we're at kind of the bottom of everything. And I hope we're at the bottom. We, we always find ways of going deeper, but um, there's such a great opportunity to change. Yeah. And it's not that tough. If all you just start doing is asking questions, you know, it's, it's the next gen selling skills have nothing to do with as much a fan as I am with challenger and, and value-based selling and all those kinds of things is it has to do with curiosity, collaborative conversations, critical thinking and problem solving, caring. If we start training people in those things and setting examples in doing this, sales results skyrocket and I can show you organizations that are skyrocketing in their performance. Just one client, uh, four years ago, we put in place a training program, the next gen training program, mm -hmm. two days on curiosity, three days on critical thinking and problem solving, two days on collaborative conversations, and then the, the final three days of pulling that all together. Their win rates in a very competitive market are well over 80%. Their average deal Whoa. values are high. They're, this is the company whose voluntary and involuntary attrition in a very tough marketplace is less than 2%. Um, wow. Their market share, their growth, you know, it's just basic fundamentals that we fail to execute. Because we look at the latest trick or gimmick. Well, I'll tell you what, Dave, we're going to bring you back and talk more about that. And one of the things we could think about is either we come back and talk about the sales executive book once you release it, mm -hmm. or we may talk about, I like to go, I always like to stand the pause. We might talk about some of these ideal um, protected names, but clients and what's taking place where they're getting those results. Because as you know, with the data, all the results are going in the wrong direction. A lot of them are going in the wrong direction, like win rates used to be one in three, they're like one in two. Yeah. You're in a technology, if you're lucky. I mean, the skyrocketing uh, rates on no decision. So nobody's adding value. So the client's not doing anything, but we'll absolutely bring you back for that conversation. This has been a great conversation. I'm sure folks are gonna wanna learn a little bit more about Dave Brock. Where would we point them? How do folks learn more um, about you? Find me Dave Brock on LinkedIn, uh, it, at David A. Brock uh, on Twitter, um, uh, Partners in Excellence blog. I, I'm very opinionated, so I, you know, blog almost daily and so on and so forth. Go buy the book on Amazon and, you know, once you, you'll find the, the secret password to get you into all these other kinds of resources. Cool. And things like that. So reach out through any of those channels. So the book, folks, Sales Manager Survival Guide, Sales Manager Survival Guide. And uh, Dave, first of all, what a unique pleasure chatting with you. And thank you so much for joining. And folks, thank you so much for listening to the Selling Well podcast. And, and if you enjoyed this as much as I did, please like and share our podcast. Don't keep it a secret. Share it with your friends like, subscribe, share. And if there's ways that we can add more value to you through this podcast, please let us know. And that's markcox at inthefunnel.com. That's my email and I check it. markcox at inthefunnel.com. 
We run the Selling Well podcast to help increase the performance and professionalism of B2B sales. So if there's another way we can help you do that, or you've got some constructive criticism for me hosting these podcasts, please let us know. We appreciate the feedback. Good selling to everybody. Thanks, Mark. This is fun. Thanks, Dave.